Uh, guys, didn't we talk about the tropics twice already? Why does the intro mention jungles? Uh, you're missing a word there. It's the uh, in bright red and all cap. I'm I'm what? Oh oh oh, concrete. Yeah, I'm sorry. Mm. <clears throat> After tackling a lot of environments and moods, it's time for us to delve to the one you may have seen before, the good old concrete jungle, and maybe show that we're better at talking about urban music than the Grammys to boot. Welcome to the Music Arcade. Hello everyone, welcome to Music Arcade. I'm Galen, the Sound Guy Firestone. I'm Monaco. And I'm Eddie, and taking pot shots at the Grammys is my favorite pastime. It's a good one. It's a good and fun one. Um. So yeah, we're talking about the big city today, and well, all the, sort of. The city's big and small, actually. Yeah, there's a couple of small ones in here, too. Yeah. Um, but, I don't know, how do we, I, Red, I think this was your topic, how do we end up coming up on this one, or is it just a thing we haven't explored yet? Uh, yeah, no, it's just, uh, hmm, we need a topic. Here's, yeah, this one, it'll do. You know those those moments when you need to come up with a name and you're just looking at the objects around you and you just go, his name is uh, Mike Ruffone. <laughs> so basically, we need we, we need a, a topic. Look at the window. Uh, city. That's the topic. Um, and with that, given the simplistic nature of this uh, starting off, why don't we just go ahead and dive right into the music? And let me tell you, you guys picked a heck of a soundtrack. Yeah, simple topic, but good songs. Damn right. And Eddie, I think you're the one starting us off this week. What do you got for us, buddy? Yeah, so, um, for full transparency and a little bit of a peek behind the curtain again, uh, the main reason this song in particular came to my mind, the song being called The Cop from Streets of Rage 4, was because of all the times we've been recording and Galen just suddenly Threw his hands up in the air because an ambulance was behind his his window. I'm on uh, the fifteenth floor. Sound really carries at this town. Yeah, uh, w we've also had to stop sometimes because I had sirens uh, outside my window. So it, it's it's close to home. Literally. Uh, yep, quite literally. But it, it, it's it's a good song. So you know if it fits. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I like this one a lot. Um, it's got kind of this proto-hip-hop drum and bass beat. It's, it's like, it's the sounds that made hip-hop before it was hip-hop. So we're looking at kind of early 80s. Then it transitions into more traditional instrumental hip-hop. A lot of yeah, layers. I th really cool. I think one of the key aspects you've uh, mentioned is the transition part, because that song is very... Straight and narrow, kind of like uh, the streets of an American city, if you will, because it's really long and very predictable, even if it's a bit of a tangled mess if you try to navigate through it. Well, not a mess in a bad way, but like, yeah. there's this musical phrase, it goes for four bar, and then another takes its place, and then another, and then another. Except, there's another set like that, that's offset by two bars, so it goes from one bit to the next and transition without this abrupt end passing by from one end to the other. Kind of like a um, DJ swapping discs frantically every two bars. Yeah, and even the samples being used here are actually, like, really impressive, because you actually have sirens and emergency vehicle noises as part of the soundscape and just blends it in as an instrument. This is really yeah. kind of ingenious. It's simple, but it really works. Like, a lot of thought and care is put into the song, clearly. Absolutely. Yeah, I and remember I... The, the first time I came across a Streets of Rage uh, for soundtrack was... as I, I was actually watching you play, uh, Galen, and I, I think you were just about to get into this stage, and when you got to it and I heard the, the sirens, th that just caught my attention instantly, because the, the use of sirens as a legitimate... Uh, musical instrument is really well done. Like some people would just throw the noise in there, but uh, uh, the composer here he, he really works them melodically too. This is Olivier Derivier, right? Uh, Olivier Derivier, yes. Yeah. 
And the only other instance of that that I can think of is Let Mom Sleep by Hideki Nagamun Naganuma, which is a pretty good comparison. I kinda like to get back to that straight and narrow feel how it all... I mean, I think in uh, the entire game there's this idea that things don't need to be more complicated than necessary. And uh, that's reflected down to the very title. Even though there's a 20 years plus gap between the previous installment and this one, yeah, yeah it's just Switch of Rage 4. It plays like Switch of Rage. Sure does. Um, yes. I'm, you know what? I'm not going to get into that like pseudo-argument, but yes. Um, and the one thing I found very cool musically was... They actually hired a whole lot of people for one or two songs around the soundtrack where they, um, people who've had backgrounds in, in, uh, beat em up games. Up to and including Yoko Shimomura turning in a track because she was actually the lead composer on the first Final Fight. Not that you'd recognize her work because it really doesn't sound like, she hadn't evolved yet into her, into her current form, so... It, very yeah, much so the game was a love letter to the genre as a whole and not just absolutely. Streets of Rage. It's a bit of an all-stars, which is why you can play uh, like characters from older installments mm -hmm. in the graphical style of the older installments with the play style of the older installments. Yes. And uh, that's very much in line with that all-star cast of music composers. It absolutely is. Um, I think it's also very interesting that um, Olivier de Rivière he he managed to land a very very interesting and diverse soundtrack and most of his work in gaming at least that i'm familiar with tends to me tends to be more cinematic slash atmospheric uh more ambience heavy mm -hmm. here it's very much about the the melodies about the the songwriting uh, yeah they want you to notice the music and he it did it really well. Yeah, and at the same time, that music goes very well in pace with the way the gameplay goes, because it's, it has this very slow and deliberate pace, even amidst something very frantic going on around, as you try to control chaos, try not to get surrounded and things like that. And mm -hmm. that's, yeah, a very solid choice to make this... Something that you feel in your bones, even if you're trying to juggle somebody. So yeah, uh, going from a French composer to a half French, half German developed game. Uh, Rana, your pick next. Okay, I give a fourth of ten to that transition, and that's being generous. <laughs> Look, yeah. you're, you're our transition guy. Yeah, but I couldn't say uh, something like uh, going from down in the streets to up and above and then pass it to myself. Anyway, Industrial Landscapes from Anno 2070. So how that works is that uh, it's a city builder game, so you already have a very different pace, a very different tone and a very different point of view. And... Uh, uh, in this game, you have uh, multiple factions that you create accommodations for uh, that have very different needs and very, very different things and very different results. The two main in kind of soft opposition being the Echoes and the Tycoons, though the first ones being very much uh, trying to... Uh, alleviate the economy, the ecological damage that uh, the uh, world has already suffered, while the tycoons are more about trying to make the best of the situation and make a tidy profit along the way. I suppose you can guess which of those two factions that track is for. If I had to guess, this one sounds like it's going to be for... My gut saying the tycoons. Yep. Okay. It very much is. They, it's uh, very... Um, 
grayish, very desaturated compared to the uh, other sides. Uh, and it's not necessarily depressing, however. They aren't the villains of the situation, but they are uh, a more literally grey faction. And uh, that's reflected nicely in the differences in soundtrack. The uh, official soundtrack uh, has uh, different cities for the two factions, in fact. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one reflects, like the title suggests, industrial landscapes, the production lines of the city you build uh, for those tycoons with uh, those uh, chains of production that go and intermingle and try to make that city tick in the first place. When I hear some part of it, especially the parts where it swells and start to become more epic in proportions, uh, I've been reminded, oddly enough, of a review video for Factorio by huh. Mandalore Gaming, in which uh, he says at some point about uh, going through your own factory that, and I quote, you even have a magical mechanicus moment where after dozens of hours playing, you're not entirely sure how the factory works anymore. Where does light all go? I don't know. Why is this belt such a mess? Did I fix it? Or was there a reason and I broke something? <laughs> you have a sort of similar feel in in the game itself, by, because it's also a management of production line, and uh, kind of a similar feel echoed in the very concept of going through a big city and going through the parts that aren't like the downtown or the commercial halls and strips, the part where only those that are supposed to know how it works are there, and otherwise it's just an area you pass through to get somewhere better, kind of liminal like that. And uh, with that kind of point of view where you're not sure what it does, only that this building and that street and that parking lot are probably important, the city takes kind of a, a beastly nature of its own going all around you, and uh, I feel that this kind of mythological vision of the city as its own entity is very well represented and reflected in that track. It sounds impressive, but it does. not s scary per se, it's kind of like Kind of like seeing Godzilla rise and not sure whether he'll help you or chomp on you. Um, I didn't That's actually get that comparison. impression. I, I, that might be a context thing. Yeah, it's mostly regarding the part that swells up the most where the French hall now unleashed and everything. Yeah, around the two minute mark. Yes. Ironically, the, the vibe I got uh, kind of fit in my mind, a little bit more with the aesthetic of the most recent game in the franchise, uh, Anno 1800. No, oh, definitely. Because uh, what I picture when that, uh, when the song swells up and all that, is more like the smokestacks of industry being built, showing Absolutely. up around the environment. Like, uh, yeah, like the parallel would... to the Industrial Revolution is very well thought. And the line is drawn naturally, you're right. Um, so I had an interesting note on this. It doesn't seem quite... The opening feels, and I use the word, secure. Yeah. Like, it presents an essence of safety, like this big... I don't want to say monolithic, but certainly, like, I mean, I'm just going to use the same word again, secure city. Like, you're not really in danger here. Yeah, no, it's not the main streets. It's just kind of brutalistic in that way. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put yeah. it. Yes, it's very, like, it's kind, secure, and comfortable, like a big slab of concrete. Right. Like, yeah. sure, it, it won't do your back any favor, but at least there's no bug to eat you. Yeah, I'd say it's, uh, it, it kind of 
fits in with other elements of this game, that it's uh, sterile. Uh, this entry in particular, uh, 2070, it's all about, you know, it's the near future and climate change is a thing, and so our technology is, is improving, we're not space travelers yet, that's for the next game in the franchise, <laughs> but uh, our technology is evolving, and there's a lot of Star trek -y vibes with buildings here and there, very clean white and all that sort of stuff, a lot of glass. And so it, it, it tends to have this, this sterile vibe. In fact, one of the big NPCs you deal with is an AI. So yeah. uh, I think it fits that aspect of the game, the, the more uh, sanitized near future visuals. Yeah, I can agree with that. The two of the world, it's very rich and very evocative, I feel. Yeah. Yeah, I if definitely agree there. Yeah, if there's um, anything I can quote-unquote crit criticize this track on, is that part of me, when it got to the more uh, grandiose bit of the the song when it really feels like you're in a an industrial environment around the the, the second half of the track mm -hmm. part of me was kind of expecting them to just go full on with the idea and bring the the chains and the anvils like howard short did for mordor in lord of oh, the rings yeah, no, I, can, I can see that i can see that like psh, sounds and uh and the likes that would certainly have uh, contributed to a more diegetic vision of uh, the, the environment. Maybe that would have been the version fitting Anno 1800. Mm. Not wrong. That would work pretty well. Um, I think we covered like everything I liked about the track on a technical level, but I'm just going to really quickly just go over it. I really like the big sweeping string and horn section this early on. I love how it builds up. Um, yeah. Really, again, it hits that really epic phase at the two-minute mark that just, just blows me away. I really like this song. Oh, yeah, this one absolutely. really kind of hit me. All right. Then let's move on to... Urban Area, a very appropriate track title for this episode. Uh, yes, and in fact, my first note is like, I mean, it's right there in the title. <laughs> exactly. Um, but honestly, this was one of two songs that popped into my head immediately when, uh, when this, uh, topic was announced. So this is the one I don't feel guilty about. No. Oh. Uh, because the other one's kind of cheating? I don't think it is. I do feel that way, but I really need to stop because I'm going to have some arguments in his favor regardless. For this one, however, <laughs> there's no cheating involved. This is a straight-up futuristic city sound brought to us by Shimagami Tensei and Persona composer Shoji Maguro for Digital Devil Saga 2, the duology of Digital Devil Saga being my favorite game of all time. Ah, yes. The divine duology of Digital Devil Saga. Go on, add one more D, I dare you. Damn it. <laughs> uh, I am not a native English, English speaker. I am not even going to try to say that three times fast. Good, Good luck, because I would absolutely trip over it. Um, I trip over saying regular sentences, never mind tongue twisters. Uh, we have the but yeah, recording well, to prove it. One of the big to reasons... my world, man. Yeah, yeah, fair. One of the big reasons I like... Good thing... So I was just gonna make a joke. It's a good thing we don't have a podcast or anything. Right? Man, anyway, true. back to the song, please. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons I really like Digital Level Saga, the duology, is the soundtrack. Like, this is probably... To me, it's Choji Maguro's best work. I know a lot of people are, like, on the Persona train. I don't see it. I, I like a lot of that music, for sure. But it's not as good as when he goes full, like, this. Um, honestly, the second he adds vocals, I tend to check out. In this case, however, it's like, we need a town area theme that sounds really futuristic and kind of peaceful, but also underlyingly tense, and he's just like, let's go. And he yeah, kind it's, of... it's very much the resting area in that uh, urban jungle. It mm -hmm. feels like uh, 
I can tell right by listening that this definitely isn't a combat area. No. It's probably some hub you get back to every now and then. And I haven't played the game. No, you're pretty much on the body. The only difference is it's actually several hubs. Like, it's it's several small okay. areas instead of one big one. Right. Like safe houses of sorts. Yeah. Yeah. Just little city areas where you can talk to NPCs and buy stuff. Yeah. It's kind of understated in a way, but it should probably be, given that it, the rest between yeah. uh, what's more active about it, it's very charming. It is, especially given how hard the rest of the soundtrack goes. I know we're not talking in depth about about Digital Level Saga or anything, but... Um, Contrast is important. Yeah. Like, this has one of the hardest battle themes I've ever heard. It The dungeons are, like, seriously energetic. Having a place to just rest your head and not be in, like... It, it really helps the contrast. Even if yeah, you're only at these parts for a fairly short amount of time. Yeah, and I feel like that time is uh, pretty important to mention, because if you compare to a person I indeed, uh, I remember watching some streams of someone playing that every time he went out of the dungeon, he was like, no, back to the good part before playing a pretty equivalent time of out-of-dungeon socializing and in-dungeon battling. Like, it's more or less 50-50 in a persona, and that doesn't feel like it is. It's just short breaks, and as a result, the contrast need to be all the more important. Correct. A hundred percent of the money there. Not every city in a video game needs to be either oppressive or extremely imposing. Uh, in fact, I, I kind of went out of my way to note down a specific sentence that was the vibe I got from this song. Mm -hmm. That is upbeat yet chill. Yeah. And a lot of these these games that have uh, hubs that you return to after combat, they they tend to have more more chill songs because it fits. It, it works well for yeah. for when you're not out in the middle of combat anymore, when you need a breather. Yeah. And this one, even just the details of the composition work really well. Like, obviously, it's very synth-heavy, but it's not too in your face about it, right? Yeah, it doesn't scream, this is the future at you. Right. It just let it speak for itself. Right. Yeah, which my, I... my mental image wasn't even very sci-fi until you said it. Because I was just picturing a, a park with trees, and like, you see the, the buildings around it, but you're at the park. Yeah, like that's, that, that's I, I think that is actually one of the... I think you actually just described one of the hub areas where this plays. Checks out. Or I guess one of the safe zones would be a more accurate statement. I don't want to call them hub areas because they really aren't. They're just places you can go. And with that, let's go ahead and move to something that's not very in your face with the synths to something that is very in your face with the synths. One Austin yeah. Wintery. Yeah, I, I said... Urban songs don't need to be oppressive. This one it kind of is because it's for John Wick. Yeah, and if that's not oppressive, you're doing something wrong. That's what that whole franchise is. Yeah, uh, this is a. Uh, the reviews for this game haven't been that great. I don't know how good of a game it is, but it's a uh, John Wick. John Wick X came out a while ago. Uh, kind of went under the radar. I haven't played it, to be honest. So my knowledge of, of the soundtrack is mostly because I follow Austin Wintry on Spotify because I like some of his stuff. Uh, I mean, good reasons, any. There's plenty to like here. Yeah, oh, yeah. Honestly, when I first listened to this track, my, my first thought was, by God, I wish Wintry was the composer for Cyberpunk 2077. Oh, yeah, like, it's good that, uh, I mean... It's a Night City track. Oh, yeah. Regardless of... Even if it's not capitalized. It's a Night City that, uh, for legal reasons, is all uh, low caps. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's Nighttime City. But yeah, Evening I... Town, if you will. <laughs> yeah. That, that's, that's fair. But yeah, I... I think the only thing I have to say is... The song has a bit of a slow start, but 
that doesn't last long. It gets its rhythm going really, really soon, really early on, and doesn't stop. It's a pretty yeah, fun and, rhythm. And the start isn't without merit either. I really like the fact that the transition happens with the sounds of what sounds like a subway train stopping. And if you're going to use city sounds, subway's a good one. Especially the transport, not the sandwich. You know, especially sitting sounds, you know, involving Keanu Reeves somehow. Like that kind of needs a subway at that point, right? Yeah. Um, this is a very tricky song. Like, it, it really kind of goes to some fairly disjointed places, but clearly that's intentional. If I were to guess, again, have having not played the game. I imagine this must be for a boss fight. Because the game is uh, an isometric tech, uh, tactical game. And the vibe I get from this is that this might be for a boss fight with its own unique mechanics that you might need to get around or something. Yeah, like multiple phases and uh, that changes the musical phrases that I want to throw from. Yeah, something along those lines is more or less what I picture. I am not sure how right I am, but it's what came to my mind inst instantly. And that would go along with the title of the track. I mean, the uncaged bear is pretty evocative. It is. Um. Yeah, I. I will say, like, in terms of evocative. It does a really good job at selling the atmosphere, like a hundred percent. Even if I, even yeah. if I do find the song itself a little uncomfortable, um, also a very interesting use of a vocoder pad for melody. Like Tool does that a lot, but they're kind of like it's hard for me. I I know I'm comparing this to Tool is kind of unfair because they're just wildly different genres. But weirdly, the usage of the vocoder is kind of what that reminded me of, kind of a talk box situation. Hmm. Yeah, and I remember for the genre of the track, especially the one that comes at the forefront at the start, uh, I remember a few episodes ago I mentioned that not every uh, every game needs to have some uh, Nightcore as part of its soundtrack. When talking about Trade Grade, I believe, and that it's gonna sound good, I'm gonna like it, but it doesn't necessarily fit all the time. That's a case where it's very much the right call. Yeah, no, this sounds like a song from John Wick. This sounds like a song from the movies. Yeah. I totally could see this playing it like a club fight. Exactly. Uh, also, I'm just going to throw this out there. Eddie, you keep saying you don't like electronic music, but once again you hit us with a hard style. Can you please <laughs> just admit you like this genre now? Turns out th this podcast is doing things to me. <laughs> <sighs> okay well then sh shall we move on to the next track yeah let's go from hard Good. style to just playing going hard wow this yeah. is a song yeah I didn't even pick it at first but then I looked at my selection I looked at everybody else's selection and I had a flashback to over two years ago now, where we wanted uh, a fourth host, uh, who knows how long those episodes would have been then, <laughs> uh, mainly to have some more different point of view. And I feel like what this election looked like uh, was the kind of reason why, because the theme was urban, and we are a white enough bunch that there wasn't really any rap track until then. Uh, the Streets of Rage 4 is definitely like proto-hip-hop, but yeah. Yes. Like, we definitely yeah, but... kind of skimped on the actual hip-hop. Yeah, and that one is very in-your-face and unsubtle, which is kind of why I like it, and it certainly fits the tone and the theme of the game it comes from. I mean, it looks like a... I don't want to call it a hero shooter, but certainly a hero something from Platinum Games, so you know it's going to be wild. A uh, hero brawler, actually. Cool. Yeah, it's 
more or less um, a, somewhere between 3D fighting game and uh, 3D uh, Stitch of Rage like, Ooh. but um, but faster and uh, with uh, uh, Bayonetta DLC. Oh, that was this game. Was this the one that had that yes. weird soccer multiplayer? Uh, I'm not sure. I think so. Okay. Because I remember there was a game from Platinum that had Bayonetta DLC and it had a weird soccer multiplayer. Yeah, I mean, there's multiple multiplayer genres. Yeah. And uh, it was kind of the main focus, which definitely wasn't Platinum Games' specialty. And uh, still isn't. <laughs> uh, but that was kind of a valiant attempt, honestly. It's uh, poor Babylon's frantic, fall. but it's fun. It's also kind of in the same universe as Mad World, I believe. Which is why it has a very similar soundtrack. That's just its natural progression. Um... Including artists that come back. And uh, I think that's one of them. Well, uh, so this song in general, it's hip hop over a rock beat. It's not rap rock. It's yes. there is a distinction there. This is very much just straight hip hop. It's just the samples being used are rock. Um, yeah. very very just it's bouncy. The the actual like MC, decent flow, good lyrical skill. Very just this is just a great song. Everything about this yeah. just clicks as a song. Like I don't listen to a whole lot of hip hop, but. Man, as as hip hop tracks go, this one's great. Yeah, it goes hard. Like, I feel with the tone that's pretty happy overall, in, in contrast with the lyrics that are all like, uh, "I gotta defend my turf." It's it really shows that a fight's either about to break out or currently ongoing. But it's kind of fun. It's kind of a fun fight everybody's looking forward to. Gotta break some head on having a good time. Mm -hmm. I didn't quite get a, a happy vibe from this, I'd say, but I More did get a enthusiastic, very... enthusiastic, I suppose. I, I, I got a very energetic vibe. Uh, not oppressive, but still energetic. Yeah. That yeah. Was, that's how I, I would describe this. Everybody's having fun. And, uh, uh, I, I even noted down, I'm... I'm not a good judge for rapping, so uh, I very rarely can tell a good rapper from a bad rapper. So uh, what I can say is I, I enjoyed the flow here. Whether the guy is particularly good or not, that's out of my wheelhouse to, to judge. Seems, I mean, he seemed good. Again, I'm, I'm not much better than you are, but I feel like in general I have enough music knowledge to be like, there's talent here. This guy isn't phoning it in. Yeah, like, it's intense, and uh, it goes hard. Yeah. And the, the MC's able to keep up with it. Like, this guy has a has a solid flow, has good lyrical skill, has that energy. Like, I'm not yeah. hearing him fall off the beat or get lazy or anything. It feels like the, the talent and the skill is there. Like, I, I, I assume he's good. And you are welcome for your new addition to... Uh... Your workout playlist. <laughs> like, it's got that energy, you it know, does. it's bouncy like that. It does. A lot of the tracks in those games do. Those games being Anarchy Reigns and Mad War. Yeah. To be clear. Well, it's it just part of... Fits the, it kind of fits the Platinum game style. Yeah, I was basically saying exactly that. That's kind of Platinum's whole, like, spiel. The one time yeah, they got I weird was, was uh, Astral Chain, which was their most experimental game anyway. Maybe not yes. their most, but definitely among their, among their 3D actioners is their most experimental. Yeah. Com comparatively out there. Yes. And I think that uh, overall that track uh, really shows uh, uh, in the lyrics in particular the fact that this isn't just a town. This is the single town. And I'm getting kind of the opposite impression from the next track, where it seems very unfamiliar of a place. Um, 
Yeah, so imagine my surprise when one of the songs that I landed on was actually from a Castlevania game. Um, imagine I've my surprise looking at our playlist and seeing a Castlevania track from a game that I played and going, wait, what's that doing there? Um, <laughs> oh, you did play Curse of Darkness? I didn't realize you had. I thought I was the only one who did. Oh, I did. I played both the PlayStation 2 titles. Oh, okay, well. I'm the only I... one that didn't here. Huh. Um... Yeah, so this is Cordova Town, which that title and that area doesn't really sell the oomph of the song itself. They really yeah, it's don't. Got, it's got a very intriguing feel to it. I like it. Yeah. Um, I mean, unfamiliar Castlevania s- soundtrack good. More news at nine. Well, I know, right? Uh... Once again, I wonder how Mercury Steam got the Castlevania part so wrong and yet the Metroid part so right. It's incredible. It really is. Anyway, um, this is not done by Mercury Steam. This is, this is, you know, Konami's 3D Castlevania T proper. Um, and this is Cordova Town. Uh, unfamiliar in game i wouldn't say it because this is a place the main character is familiar with but it's also thrashed now and wasn't before so you're kind of well, cities change yep you're kind of going through town fighting a whole bunch of you know undead and crap yeah like uh, this has kind of uh i mean i should hear them again cyber say to make that comparison for sure but this has kind of uh a uh, slower pace compared to especially the previous one, but uh, kind of similar to the Digital Devil Saga track. But even with similar pace, this is clearly not a safe area. No. And yeah, it is I... on the lower tempo side. It feels like everything yeah, I... is just still kind of moving steadily as opposed to... Yeah, I, I honestly, I had completely forgotten about the presence of the electric guitar on this song. Uh, so that took me by surprise on uh, re-listen for this episode. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it. I think on our Castlevania special, I mentioned that uh, to me, the Curse of Darkness soundtrack, I I wasn't 100% a fan because of the synths, which are a bit divisive among fans of, uh, of the, yeah. the, the, the franchise. You're not the but first person is, to say that. Yeah, th- th- this... I'd say this is a track where they work well, because you're already going with electric instruments by bringing the guitar up very early on in the track. Mm-hmm. Adding those synths in, they they fit very well on this song, even to me, uh, versus other more, let's say, organic songs. Tracks. Yeah, so. Some more Pun intended. ambient music esque track. This one is is more towards the electric slash electronic side, so it fits in uh, really well. And it's it's much more of a banger than I remember. Yeah, this one kind of grew on me. I mean, of the songs that I didn't immediately fall in love with on the soundtrack at any rate, there were several that just sort of grew on me, and this is definitely one of them. Um, It didn't feel right to me at first, but it was one of those that the more I listened to it, the more I found myself connecting with it. So, um, and it felt really good for this one because it does feel very, like, forward-facing, very busy in a good way, very deliberate. And the start of it almost sounds like a western track, honestly. I love how you say that, because I actually have that exact same comment about one of your picks. No. Oh. Um, but yeah, I can see it. I can kind of see that, if not for the heavy guitar. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what else I can really add to this one. It. I'm The, the one thing I'm not sure of is that it's... I'm not sure it's appropriate for the area it finds itself in in-game, which is, you know, a small, busted up town. Because it does... That's probably what made it catch me by surprise, because I... I have some vague memories of what the place looked like, and it evokes more Resident Evil vibes in its aesthetics than we'll go with 
heavy guitars vibes. Yeah. Yeah, like, I don't get the ruins. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. It, it, this song feels too clean for it to be ruined. Um, Does at this... least fit the, the pace of the combat in Curse of Darkness. Oh, absolutely. It's not as fast-paced as a full-on uh, brawler. Yeah. But it's also not completely slowed down. It's that typical Castlevania uh, tempo, let's say, just in 3D. Yeah, I like how the drum texture on the song changes. Um, I think that's something a lot of people kind of miss. It starts with a more, like, tribal, and then it goes into more rock drums as the song goes on. I certainly was among the people that missed it, but... Uh... I, I found, going through our playlist, that the percussion tends to be a very... Very interesting thing, you know, these uh, urban, let's say, songs that we've picked. It tends, tends to elevate a few, of the, a few of the tracks here. Or the lack thereof can sometimes kind of screw with my mind, but we'll get there when we get there. Well, you would know best, Eddie, because your next pick is like drums, 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 drums which it should be given the, you know... Given the and genre. then a little bit of sponge to clean things up. Quite. Welcome to the world of Samba. So, th this comes from the first Sims game. And uh, for the first Sims game, they actually had uh, in-house, or I don't know, maybe they hired composers. But at, at any rate, it was stuff composed for the game to use in the radios. Rather than uh, licensing songs from uh, famous bands or singers like right. they did for The Sims 2, 3, and 4. And will probably do for Sims 5 as well, I'm sure. Uh, this has some funny results because I am not sure if they already had the the policy that every song would have to be in Simlish. Because if they had, someone failed at picking up the fact that there was a lot of Portuguese in this song. Yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah, the, this is... The vocals... I mean, I don't speak Portuguese, and I don't speak Simlish either. But this seems a bit too articulate to be Simlish. Correct. I didn't realize that it was supposed to be Simlish at some point, because this didn't sound like that at all. Yeah, I, I'm guessing they started that, uh, with that policy in Sims 2, where every licensed track is covered in, in Simlish part of the game. Uh, but yeah, this one, it it's very much a, a typical Samba track. Uh, it has... N not all the lyrics here are meant to make sense, in fact, I'd say half of the sung uh, sounds are just nonsense, mm -hmm. which is very common in uh, more more laid-back samba, let's say. And this, as a Brazilian, I guess I'm I, I am not done talking about the <laughs> the tropics. Uh, this evokes to me images, particularly of favelas. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna. I was getting the favela vibe myself, and I, I, you have far more experience with that than I would, just given your, you know, location. Honestly, if I knew you we were going to take cast that hard, I'd have be picked an accordion piece. <laughs> Fair, uh, but yeah, it's something. I, I think it's still worth noting that a lot of people have this warranted view, but limited. All favelas as being very oppressive areas uh, because of gang crime and all that. But these people, at least until the advent of mobile phones with internet and access to social media, a lot of people in poorer areas in Brazil had, a, as a pastime, they would just get together as a group, go to a, a pub, and play some samba at the pub. Some yep. famous bossa nova singers have said they used to do that. 
before they became uh, world famous singers. Yeah, I remember so you talking is... about that during one of your um, one of your civilization discussions. Yep, uh, I, I believe Chico Buarque is one of the the singers who uh, went on record to say they they used to do that uh, in uh, around Copacabana, which mm -hmm. incidentally Copacabana is a name check on this song. And uh, I'm I'm also pretty convinced the singer here is actually Brazilian, mostly because he actually pronounces words like manhã correctly, which Americans never get right. I mean, yeah, it sounds like this is an actual samba song, more or less, right? Like it, it between the percussion and the mixing, I'm like, this was probably recorded in Brazil somewhere. I would imagine it is credited to one of the the many composers for The Sims One. So I'm not sure how they worked it out, but it does feel like a legitimate uh, samba track to me. Interesting. And, and I, I am one of those Brazilians who actually grew up not enjoying samba. Uh, it, it's a genre that has grown on me over the years. Mm. And this is one of the, the examples of samba that I, that I enjoy. I, I really dig how... Uh, what they came up with when coming up with a, a Brazilian song for their Latin radio station. <laughs> so, before I talk about the actual, like, parts of the song, I just want to say this. When I was going through the listen through of this playlist, the playlist was in a different order than it is now. And the song that this one was directly after was literally Industrial Death Metal. <laughs> so I have some pretty hard mood whiplash when it comes to this song, and therefore my reactions to it. Like, yeah. we went from going very hard from a song that apparently is for now playing, to going, you know, here. <laughs> and it's, um... <laughs> I'm alright. I'm okay. Yeah, yeah, no, that... Um, All wounds heal, even the whiplash wounds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as for the song, like I already mentioned, the, the drum track is just fantastic. Like, the percussion, it's Brazilian samba. If you have bad percussion, you failed on every just intrinsic level, right? And it's also timely, because as of the time we're recording this podcast, it's Carnival Weekend. And yeah, I mean, yeah. If you're Hearing that it's back Carnival, and forth. If, if you're unfamiliar with Carnival, Samba is everything that plays during mm -hmm. Carnival. Yeah, and generally folk music, like we have Mardi Gras here as well, and I, I just... There's a lot more accordion than Samba, but uh, it's folksy fe festive atmosphere, and uh, I think that plays into one important aspect of urban music, is that, which is that Cities are different around the world, and a lot of different people make different things with their cities. Mm -hmm. And music reflect that as well. Yeah, hundred percent. And um, yeah, um, I do like the vocals here. I'm I'm surprised to hear it was from one of the original. I mean, I know you said the actual singer is almost certainly Brazilian, but I'm still very surprised that this. That this particular song is actually uh, written by one of the composers, because I would not have called that being an in-house track at all. So, uh, according to the album credits, the I guess singer and percussionist, uh, it's credited to one uh, Marquinho Brasil. I am not familiar with this guy, to be honest. Uh, honestly, in the in the credits, they even mis misspell his name, which <laughs> go team. Uh, yeah, yeah, go go ea go. But yeah, Jerks. according to to Discogs, he is mainly a percussionist, and he does percussion work for other uh, artists. And uh, in samba, uh, when we are not talking about uh, official officially released, uh, officially recorded samba albums, the vocals are generally improv. And so the fact that this 
dude is a percussionist. It makes sense. He's probably uh, was probably mainly tasked with aiding with the percussion for for the music, but the the lyrical aspect, let's say, it just kind of comes as you play in in genres like this. Right. But yeah, in uh, in the just actual out. in the actual credits in the album, he's uh, credited as Marquino Brazil, Brazil with a Z, and Marquino spelled as if it was Italian. So <laughs> thanks, Ye. Uh way to go, way to go. But yeah, it turns out Brazilian guy singing for the first Sims game. I wouldn't have expected that until I stopped to listen to the song. That's actually really awesome. And uh, as as a final note on the song, I kind of I kind of chuckle at the fact that they decided to name pretty much every track as a, a pun on the word sim, because sim in Portuguese can be translated as yes. So this song, the song title, can literally be translated as yes samba and uh yeah, yeah. yes samba samba yes it samba, sure is samba. Yeah. i'm good with that now then we went to one side of the world let's go to another Galen, take it away with battle of anigawa yeah that's the better best i've got for the transition yeah i have to admit the transition's weird because the song is weird and the only reason it's on this list is entirely contextual yeah, uh, in my note is the world explain. Uh, well, it's simple, because I know for a fact you've played the game that I'm going to be referencing with this song. I know for a fact you have. Because, yeah, the Battle of Onigawa on its face, especially when listened to in the Samurai Warriors context, is lush riverlands in the 1700s. Or even 1600s, Jokes excuse on me. you, I haven't played Samurai while you're free. Well, we're not even Which talking about... Which is the makes you sent. Well, that's... I mean, yes, it's the version I set, but that's only because... The one time where they decided to drop a whole bunch of skyscrapers on this map was not in Samurai Warriors 3. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, to wit... It was with another 3. It was in another 3, in fact. Glad you caught the thread there. Uh, in fact, there's only one man I can blame for this in an insane mess, and that is Ryu Hayabusa, the star of Ninja Gaiden. So, a few weeks ago, I, uh, during the episode on the beach, I brought up Ayane's theme for Warriors Order T3. Because, you know, she has a very beachy theme. Yes. Kind of the opposite occurs in the very same game, in the very same time, it depends on which one of these levels you decide to do first, you actually have a choice. You go to the Battle of Anagawa in Warriors Order T3, you turn a corner, and all of a sudden, the lush riverlands have gone away, and now you're in a big city. And it's as a so result, good. those skyscrapers are actually the first thing I think of now when I hear this song. Yeah, I mean, it's a striking visual. That's part of why uh, they're striking in uh, games like Neo Automata. It's mm -hmm. a very strong visual here as well, and there's not even that part of contrast, of surprise. Yeah. Like, literally, you round a corner and you're in a city now. It's like, oh, this is cool. And there were a lot of yeah. optional levels on this stage, too, that really explored that city segment more than I think the base level did, which is good, right? Because you kind of need those. Yeah, exactly. There was the usual, we're going to have our straight-laced people like Joe Tai and Ina go around and make people stop being drunk or punish them for being drunk. That was a fun one, and that played on this map, and that played in this zone, and everyone was drunk, and it was good times. <laughs> um, but yeah, musically, I would say it doesn't fit. And the only reason it's here is entirely context, because I can't think of the song and not see skyscrapers, and I had to call that out. Yeah, no, that checks out. And in general for this game, uh, and the, the Warriors franchises as a whole, uh, the soundtrack do tend to focus on locations over characters. Mm -hmm. So... The fact that it is in uh, an episode about essentially location types doesn't surprise me too much. 
But that was certainly a bit of a stretch and I'm glad to hear the explanation because now that makes about a bit more sense. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, no, on its own it wouldn't make any sense at all and I'm very aware of that. Good. Yeah, yeah this, the... is, this is entirely guilt by association. Yeah, when, when I was listening to the strike, the, the only vaguely urban image that came to my mind was like maybe a a shrine in the middle of a Japanese city or something, and it's the thing for the shrine. No, that's I missed the and context. Actually, that's that's exactly the opposite. It's a bit of city in the inside of something that's much more Japanese uh, and uh, ancient Japanese. Mm -hmm. In fact, so that's an interesting inversion. Yeah, and yeah, the music itself is uh, pretty chill. It's one of the more Dancing track, I would say. Yeah. Like, it's a, like, it's a, not an elaborate choreography, just a vibe into the rhythm of the, of the song. Uh, yeah, it's, it's that kind of song. It's mm -hmm. a, a pleasant mix of uh, pop music and uh, folk, uh, Japanese folk. Yeah. yeah. And Samurai Wars as a whole tends to skew fairly electronic. So the fact that this is one of the more folky tracks on the soundtrack, and this is the one that gets the hit. Like, if I played Kawana Kajima here, you'd all be like, oh, that makes sense, even though it has nothing to do with it. A correction. Samurai Warriors to the almost whole is pretty electronic. True. Uh, five was a weird one. Five was a weird one. I, I'm still very much a proponent of that game and very thankful it exists, but it was a weird one. They definitely yeah. made some I'm interesting glad they changes. Tried something. Yeah. Me too. They needed to sweep the board, and I'm hoping this is kind of a precursor to Dynasty Warriors 10, which also probably needs a board reset at this point, but at the same time... Yeah, more like Dynasty Warriors 10 years since the last good one. Uh, we, As we discovered Goddamn. the other day. Literally 10 years. Yeah. Dynasty Warriors 8 was 2013. It's 2023. What happened? Crazy. <sighs> anyway, shall we move on? Yeah. All right. Then let's go to Red Rock Riviera from Disco Elysium. Hey, remember when I said that there was a song that I thought Wild West on when I first heard it? Yeah, no, yeah. That, I understood that was this one very okay, good. much. Okay, good. Like, uh, I can see the parallel between the horn and the harmonica. Yep. It just feels at first like you're on the range, but it starts industrializing as we go. Um... It's a very chill track. Very yeah. calming. I, I, I did put in my notes towards the end, it's vaguely reminiscent of Traffic, which I think that build-up is quasi-intentional. It's, uh... Okay, I picked that track because, uh... Kind of the similar reason that you picked Battle of Anegawa, actually. It's because, for me, it's as well a track where I listen to it and I can't not see the city behind it. Except there's uh the city is very different of course and uh, I'm from a small town and I've lived there for over 35 years now. I know my town and I know the town next door. There's two towns I know. Everything else is pretty much strange territory. And uh, I feel like after having played the game, I know Martinez on that level. <laughs> it's uh, it's one of my favorite games, first and foremost, and probably one of the games I think is the most important in recent years. And uh, it's a game as much about its characters as it is about its city. Except if you want it to be more about one or the other, uh, you can shift the focus depending on choices down to your choice of skills. Because in these games, skills also are characters in your head. Like, uh, and to the point where in my room I only have one piece of art that isn't a figurine of a on a shelf. And it's a metal plate poster of one of the skill icons in the game. 
Oh, that's cool. Be- yeah, because they have such an actual personality to the point where they sometimes conflict with each other. Oh, wow. And one of the, yeah, and one of the skills is called Shivers, and you learn along the way that it's not just an aspect of yourself. Shivers is filling the city and having the city itself literally talk to you. I, I thought you were going to say your poster was for the electrochemistry. <laughs> nah, I'm not about that life. Um, the, that one I have in my room is Volition, actually. Because everybody else is compromised. Just so Gillen's on the loop, uh, electrochemistry is a skill that is a voice in the back of your head constantly telling you to drink alcohol and do drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so... To tell a bit more about uh, the music and the city, uh, because they are very intertwined, like, you start wake, waking up uh, in uh, your hotel room, you try to get dressed, that's the first quest of the game, is getting dressed, and you can't die doing that. And uh, you do things in the hotel, which is a bit of a smaller, more contained area, and the first time you step out, either on the balcony or outside of the hotel proper, you have those horns, and the camera zooms back, and it's just... It's a whole vibe, you know, it's this poor town that's still bearing heavily the scars of a war that it lost. It's ramshackle, but at the same time, kind of set in its way, it's corrugated steel and concrete, it's the docks nearby as well, it's uh... It's more than just one single place, and it's just it's more than any single one of those streets. It kind of all of the sounds intersecting to make the city's beating hearts and uh tying it all back to you through your nerves and your ears. I find it, like uh... the songs of uh, that uh, you mentioned, especially at the end where it becomes more busy with the traffic, that's definitely more of a industrialized uh, port that's nearby, even though it's not that present, mainly because there's currently a strike going on. Which, of course, appeals to my friend's self. That's right, I didn't need accordion to make it local. <laughs> well, oh that's a way to bring it around. Yeah. I find it interesting, uh, the, the changes they've made to this track from the album to the game. Because uh, to those not in the know, the the original so- the original version of Red Rock Riviera was actually uh, I I guess I would say it's an indie rock song uh, by a band. They now go by Sea Power. They used to go by British Sea Power, and well, they for the game they pretty much took out the guitars and the drums and made it uh, much more. Uh, ambient, I'd say. Yeah, I was about to say, I didn't get indie rock off of this song at all. Yeah, the the version yeah, in no, the game but... isn't. Yeah, and like, the devs clearly like the indie band, given that uh, one of the possibilities you have once you get, uh, uh, I think it's petrol you can use as paint in order to uh, uh, cover a wall with uh, a graffiti of your choice. And one of them is literally uh, the logo of Einsturzente Neubauten. Which is, uh, like, they are actually credited in the game because of their logo. And it's something that's completely missable, like most of the content in this game, honestly. Yeah, I missed that one because I rolled too, uh, too low on my skill. I can't remember which skill. But the one for... Out. Sorry? Art. I no, I think, think it. I think it was the one. Another check earlier on when you're looking at the wall and thinking of like it's hmm. missing something. Probably in London Empire then. Probably. But yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> and I deliberately skipped that because Inland Empire sounded compromised from the get-go. Like, it felt like not all of your skills wanted your own good. Pretty <laughs> much. Uh, yeah, I... The, the horns in this, this song are just so evocative. Like, if, yeah. if you're not familiar with them, as soon as we're done with the episode, go listen to this track or the original version on the, the album by... Or better, go play the game. Or do all three. Um, yeah. Didn't the We're developers turn out to be jerks? Uh, not no. the devs, the no, no. executives. Oh, Got it. Yeah, the, so problem is that, the problem is that they started as an art collective and then they got bought out and then they got left out of their original uh, collective slash company to the point where they disbanded and uh, basically expect nothing from this Elysium 2 and don't feel morally wrong to pirate the, the first one. That's literally a message uh, that the, I believe the, the game director posted? Yeah, oh. I think so. At least the, the one that was uh, one of the founders of the collective. Yeah, it's... Uh... Some weird shenanigans. They they needed the money, and turns out the people who gave them money are scumbags. But and allegedly. you know what's great about that is that they saw it coming so much that one of the places you can explore in a mostly abandoned mall is a former company office that disbanded, in which they tried to make a game project take off the ground until it eventually bloated out of proportion and failed completely yikes yeah yeah that that whole room is a big oof <sighs> yeah it's meta on so many levels and i know we're talking more about the game than the song but the song is maybe a bit too understated and at the same time it feels too much like part of the city which itself is part of the game to now talk about all of these uh, interconnected parts. It's, it's a weird thing where technically it's a licensed song where they did edit it, they changed it a lot, but it's still technically a licensed track, which they mostly licensed just for those horns in the beginning. And, and what horns they are. What horns they are. Uh, and it ends up pretty much being the the audio version, the audio reflection of the city's whole identity, I'd say. Yeah, like I hear I'm there, I'm right there. He's not wrong. Now then, shall we move on from one rock song adaptation to another just song and explain yourself galen well that's not going to be hard to do but uh yeah we're going from not we're going from very subtly licensed to this is just a flat out licensed track yes this is bark at the moon by ozzy osbourne one of the classics of the new wave of british heavy metal in the 80s yeah so imagine if you will a game set in the 80s with various radio stations and ah. this song is kind of on there as you're driving around Miami. Oh wait, no, Miami doesn't exist in this universe. As you're driving around Vice City. I wonder ah. what game you're talking about. Yeah, I wonder too. Uh, we're also going from like um, we're also going from, you know, tiny indie game with director difficulties to the most profitable single player franchise sorry the most profitable console franchise of all time yeah and that is of course grand theft auto vice city um this one i even wrote in my notes is the same for me category as the osprey was for crazy taxi it's just so intrinsically associated with this game you put yeah, on the like, rock station, uh, you got, you know, y you have the hits of the 80s. You got Maiden, you have Priest, you have 
autograph turn up the radios I discovered only the other day. I didn't remember that song at all from the game, but, you know, sure. And you have this. Yeah, no, it's crazy, it's crazy that Ozzy Osbourne recorded, recorded that game's OST before the studio was even founded. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's true. Like, this is one of the things that I, when I said I was cheating, um, I do tend to feel that way about licensed music, which is kind of a shame, because music supervision is hard. And I said this exact same thing the last time we talked about licensed music. Yeah, it's still true today. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and follow up with Grand Theft Auto 4, and specifically the Lost and Damned DLC, to show how hard music supervision is. So in the base game of Grand Theft Auto 4, you had your, like, hardcore punk station. Mm -hmm. But in The Lost and Damned, they brought in Max Cavalera, a name that I'm sure Eddie is at least familiar with. He's the band leader behind, he used to be for Sepultura, now he's for Soulfly, and a bunch of other projects. He's also kind of a raging jerk, but, you know, whatever. And they had him mix that station with actual, like, heavy metal and death metal in that same vein and they clashed Ooh. really hard and that was actually a very intentional process but to the tra the untrained ear that'd be like why is this song playing next to this other song they sound terrible together oh. that was deliberately tanking music supervision to make a point a bad one i would say but you know i'm not sure why you'd make that as your point going back to the 80s and going back to vice city no, every single radio station was kind of perfect, and just because I'm a rock and metal guy, I stuck with the rock and metal station. I feel that uh, one of the things that's important is that uh, Vice City was made in a different era than uh, we are today, yeah. and uh, a different situation than the last five years, which kind of pushed forward a certain vision of the 80s that kind of distorted partly through Vice City's very own lens into being more flashy than it actually was. Yeah. And this point of origination uh, p that's part of uh, the whole vaporwave new 80s uh, aesthetic, uh, that's Vice City, I feel still had a, a desire to recreate something that's more authentically 80s. Yeah. And again, the music selections really do bear that out. Although one, although in that they did have two parody hair metal tracks by an in-house band called Love Fist. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm down. I didn't pick either of those tracks. They're, they're too obviously parody. They're low-hanging fruit. And I'm just like, I don't even like these. Well, this is a GTA game we're talking about. They're not known for the subtlety. Correct. Uh, and again, that comes into soundtrack. I cannot tell you the vibe that went through me every time this song came up on the radio when I was playing that game. Like, they had two minutes for midnight for Maiden. They had Breaking the Law by, uh, by Priest. They had all of these great tracks. This was the song that made me just want to go. Yeah, and there's always a song like that yeah. in any, uh, game of that genre of your radio station, isn't it? Yeah. Which... Reminds me, actually, of the fact that they actually made it uh, a clear point and made it almost a mechanic in Saints Row 2, mm -hmm. where uh, every single of the six voices you have uh, sings over their favorite song, mm -hmm. which is different for each of the voice, except they don't have one song, they have two songs, because... Everybody has their own song, and then everybody sings to take on me. Yep, and then they actually followed it up in Saints Row the Third as well. You had uh, What I Got by Sublime, same thing. Everyone sings along with that <laughs> in an actual story sequence, and then they all had their favorites beyond that as well. Yeah, and that shows very well that they know the genre games like Vice City created yeah. and popularized. Exactly. Um, and while you can make the serious argument that Saints Row is largely parody, or at least it was at that time, I think it's kind of evolved with its own wacky identity since then. Yes. Um. Two and three were the heart of Saints Row. Yes. Hard agree there. Um. I think the music supervision in Vice City, and honestly, I could do a whole thing about the sound design and sound supervision entirely 
for Vice City and just do a whole, like, documentary on that. Because it is really kind of important from a development angle. Um, the game starred Ray Liotta, the late, great, late Ray Liotta. That never happened before. They never, no one, no game before that had gotten a star of that caliber, ever. I'd watch that for our video essay. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much going on with the sound and with the casting and with everything else. And again, this song kind of is the jewel, the crown jewel of it. Because you're playing a video game on the PlayStation 2 that's blasting Ozzy Osbourne as you're going through 80s Miami. It kind of doesn't get any better than that. That's just yeah. one of those moods that's never going to be re recreated, never going to be replicated, never going to be replaced. So when I said I had two songs that came to mind immediately when this episode title came up, the first one was, in fact, you know, Digital Level Saga 2, and the other one was this. Bark at the Moon by Ozzy. You know, to it's... One of the things that also comes to mind is uh, an unflattering comparison because that immediately sends you back when I think of another open world game that's very urban and inside a city that's in the 80s, I think Yakuza 0, which patently didn't have that at all. No, that used like, like modern They EDM. went out electronic and completely anachronistic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and beyond that, the series, like, I'll come back to that later, but I searched for a game that in the series that would fit the bill because it's so urban in its identity, and I didn't really land on something as satisfying as what we've picked or what has been picked like that. Now, there is a little bit of uh, city identity that's formed up eventually, but uh, it's very much not on the level of uh, some of the more popular games of the genres, Vice City and the, the rest of the big GTA 3 trilogy on the forefront. Yeah, no, I, I, I will tell you right now that I actually did primarily uh, compare my Yakuza 0 playthrough to Vice City and how those two, how those two, like, visions of 80s organized crime and how different they were. Yes, absolutely. Honestly, I think even within the the GTA franchise, I've played pretty much every every game. I just didn't play the the DLCs for for GTA Four, uh, Ballad of Gay Tony, and Lost and Damned. Mm -hmm. uh, but even then, throughout the the franchise, I think Vice City to me felt like the last one where there was sort of a cohesive. Uh, I guess sound direction. Yeah, uh, when it comes to the radio stations, I uh, would make a the... significant argument that it's the last one that had cohesive direction. Period, because things started going astray at uh, at San Andreas, and then has continued to just bloat. Yeah, I think bloat's that's, a word. That's that's definitely a point I, I agree with. But uh, speaking uh, particularly to the the radio stations. Uh, Vice City m managed to both capture the identity of 80s as well as make some very balanced radio stations where every station felt uh, it felt like the songs fit together with one another within that station. Yeah. Which is, I think, for games that came after, even in the G GTA franchise, they either stopped doing that or they focused on specific radio stations and the others uh kind of lost that uh identity uh yeah, San Andreas, I think they... for example uh the hip-hop station is fairly cohesive but the rock station is a mess eh? and yeah I, I even brought up in our discussions for for the episode uh a track from gj5 um, Fire Doesn't Burn Itself by uh, Sam Flax, which plays on the same radio that plays Cocaine by the Fiddler. If you're familiar at all with Fiddler and you hear uh, 
fire doesn't burn itself by Sam Flex. Like, you start that, asking questions about why yeah, they are Yeah, that doesn't the track station. at all. Um, I wanted to talk about the Sam Flax track, honestly, but I think that's kind of unnecessary given the circumstances. Yeah, it is. For full transparency, I enjoy both of those songs, and both of those songs have memories to me. Yeah, uh, but where not I listen together. to them, and I instantly go back to the GTA Five. I instantly picture myself driving around the highways of the GTA Five version of San Andreas. But they don't belong together. <laughs> no, no, they don't. Music supervision is hard, and yeah, they do. yeah, it's like you have to create a cohesive like message through the songs and through the sounds you pick. Otherwise, it's just slop. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, when I said listening to the Samba song right after industrial death metal, the whiplash is real and you don't want to inflict that on your listeners. Exactly. And, uh, I feel that it's important for, to take in the film urbanity as a whole, that, uh, whether through selection or original composition, the, the songs really can have that effect of just transporting you back to uh, a game's place and a game city and a lot of those are very carefully crafted and I feel like the musical identity that derived from them can really help cement, pun unintended for once, uh, the image of that city inside of your mind. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is about all we have on this topic. Let's talk about what we've been playing this past couple of weeks. Music Arcade, now playing. Great, now let's talk about a game I haven't been playing. Go Please. On. Okay, so, like I said before, I wanted, given how much uh, Yakuza we've been playing recently, to look at what... Uh, uh, other games in the series uh, might have uh, in stock that might give the cities a clearer identity. And I considered some of uh, uh, Yakuza 7, but that felt too much like a battle track than a city track. Mm -hmm. And then I l considered looking forward, but then I didn't want to listen to games I was going to play, which left one option, which was how different is the Feast of the North Star Lost Paradise soundtrack, which is Yakuza in Feast of the North Star. Right. Uh, is, compared to uh, the rest of the main series. Yeah, Hokuto no Kiryu the... here is, um, this song goes. Remember Industrial Death the Metal? The entire soundtrack goes. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually looking forward I to playing this. It. I might actually get it on my, on my PlayStation and play through I it during this challenge. I just want to that uh, the, the expression Hokuto no Kiryu uh, it will never not be funny to me. Oh, it's very strong. Yeah. And uh, it's... Yeah, I know. Like, I listened to that soundtrack and I knew I couldn't not talk about it because that would be morally wrong because it's not just that track. That track I pick because it's this noteworthy, hyperactive metal track. It boy howdy. And, uh, I know that will capture the heart in there. If like it's if that song it's Spotify, fast, it's busy, but it's clean as well. You you talked about uh, workout playlist earlier. If this one is on Spotify, it's going on mine. It might be. Um. I know they have been releasing some of them. I've been paying a little bit of attention to the Yakuza game subreddit, and that's come up. Um, but yeah, uh, my first words on this song are, I am headbanging, because I was. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I, I find it wonderful that the two metalheads didn't pick this track you did. Yeah, no, that's uh, in part a gift for you. It is much appreciated. Yeah. And, Thank you, uh, like, I guess. Like, it's always nice when you listen to a game soundtrack and that makes you want to play the game. Mm -hmm. But that definitely uh, was into play. Not only because of the music themselves, which are 
almost all absolutely excellent, mm -hmm. but also because of some of the visuals, like the Amon clan is in this game as well. So I've heard. And you don't just hide them, you raise them too. You raised Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. In other games I've actually played, however, uh, I've played, uh, I've gotten back into some Atelier Sophie 2, and uh, given how complex that game system can be, it's nice that I was able in uh, just a couple of short sessions to get back to the messy bits of alchemy. Nice. Which are uh, completely arcane for somebody uh, that uh, would just drop in. And uh, I like those systems. It's surprising that a direct sequel is uh, that came back later and is an isekai is also one of the series' best single game standalone experience somehow. That doesn't make any sense. That really doesn't. The way but... you just explained that, I'm just like, this sounds like Gar, and you're like, no, it's awesome. I'm like, okay. Yeah, no, it's it's genuinely fun, and uh, the soundtrack, however, is a bit unremarkable compared to the rest of the series. It's just kind of the same happy-go-lucky, hit some flute, hit some of strings, uh, have a good time. Uh, which is why I didn't put any uh, specific track in there. The other game that I've played and I haven't put any specific track in there was Valheim. And I didn't put a track in there because we already talked about the song I wanted to put in in episode 23 when Eddie was playing Valheim. Okay. And yeah, when you are actually building your little cottage and uh, smelting your little ingots, those uh, woodwinds uh, really get uh, stuck into your head. Told ya. <laughs> In a way, it can send you back to a town you are building by your very own hand. So, so it's topical of a no playing. I like it. Um, I, on the other hand, had to break the rules. Oh dear. I uh, had the same problem as I had last episode, which is I'm either playing things we shouldn't be talking about, or I played something I've already talked about. So I'm going to break the rules and just talk about, you know, Yakuza Kiwabi 2. All right. Um, and I mean, that song, that game soundtrack is very good. It is excellent. It this is one of my favorite. This is my favorite soundtrack of the franchise thus far. Like, just ah, flat out my favorite. Number two for me. I'm guessing behind Like a Dragon? Behind Like a Dragon. I'm looking forward to hearing that. Um, but man, this one has some good tracks. Uh, the one yeah. I actually posted for now playing specifically was one that isn't on the soundtrack. Sega? Oh, really? You done goofed. The actual but official... It's so good! Yeah, no, the actual official Kiwami 2 soundtrack includes none of the side stuff and none of the field themes. It's just bosses and the end credits. Sorry. That doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. They cut, like, half the soundtrack out. I had to find an unofficial soundtrack to get... Everything from the Cabaret Club, everything from uh, the clan creator, the Amon battle theme, like the Joe Amon what? battle theme, Fiercest Warrior is not on the official soundtrack. They goofed. They goofed hard. Yeah, because when I think of a Yakuza game, what I think is clearly, oh, the site content isn't important. Right, yeah, uh-huh. Or the field themes, like, like one of the themes, like, yeah. you haven't gotten here yet, but the final quote-unquote dungeon run of the game, that's not on the soundtrack either. It's one of the most important one of the most important songs in the in the game soundtrack. It's not on the official soundtrack. That's crazy. Yeah, and yeah, like uh, I was uh, saying, the fact that unlike Kiwami One, which had uh, different battle themes for the types of goon that you face, mm -hmm. the fact that here you have two cities and one battle theme for each city establish the different character of Kamurocho versus Sotenbori. Yep. Oh yeah, Beautiful. that reminds me, you know what else is not on the official soundtrack? Either of those regular battle themes. What? Mm -hmm. What is on the soundtrack if they're taking every important part out? An orchestral live recorded version of Majima Construction, all of the boss themes, the 
required boss themes of the game and the end credits. End list. <sighs> There's 20 tracks on this thing. That's not a lot. The unofficial soundtrack adds two and a half hours of music. Yeah. I'm starting to feel like we should go back to the topic of uh, sound direction. This isn't sound direction, this is publishing. Yes. And the publishers fucked up. Someone's getting a bleep and it isn't me for once. I, yeah, but this felt... Uh, some words just have to be said. Yeah, this felt yep. earned to me. I'm like, I just have to say this and I will bleep myself later. I don't mind. Yeah, yeah Sega no, really dropped tough. the ball on the official soundtrack of this one. Indeed. So, uh, one of the reasons I showed off the boss battle to the Cabaret Club, which is a track that goes way harder than it has any right to. It's incredible. It reminds me of uh, the another track that goes way harder than it has any right to be, which is the FF14... Uh, uh, Lords of Verminium track. Yeah. Yeah, same kind of deal. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's the boss theme to this totally just silly side game that sounds incredible and isn't on the soundtrack, and I'm like, I need to share this with at least you guys, because I know you'll appreciate it. Yeah. Also, Bruce mentioned that I'm going to uh, go deeper in during our next uh, uh, Kiwami uh, and uh, Like a Dragon series uh, podcast, mm -hmm. but I'm still incredibly mad at the fact that for one of the key scenes in the game, they changed the backing soundtrack from some very sweet jazzy theme that really slots in nicely to certain body's identity and changed it to some terrible piece of J-Rock. Yeah, I would agree there. Uh, that, was, that was not a great music direction decision. Definitely not. I wonder if it's because of a licensing issue. I have to assume so. Else. Yeah, but even so, the replacement was definitely not the call as far as I'm concerned. Which is weird because between one and Kiwami, there was a, a lot of difference in the song texture and the songs that I use, which is why I like original Yakuza soundtrack way better than Kiwami's. Two, there's way less of a difference, and that's the most glowing part. Yeah, I kind of think that that's one of the reasons why a lot of these tracks got... No, because Cabaret Club didn't exist back then. You know what, no, scratch yeah. the thing I was about to say. They literally just ignored okay. the side content. Nothing for Majima Construction yeah. except the Anthem at all, which also, that yeah, strategy and... RPG game, really cool soundtrack. Shocker. Yeah, and uh, you know what track was also in the original? Outlaws Lullaby. Uh-huh, the battle theme. Which, yeah. Why did that not make the regular soundtrack? Come on! Sorry. Why did that not make the regular soundtrack? Yeah, no, the official soundtrack is crap. Like, I do not say these words lightly. This is me as an audio engineer going, do not support this. Do not support Sega's half-assed release of a really incredible soundtrack. Don't do it. Yeah. Do not just, do not give them your money. They don't deserve it. No, Eddie, talk about Destiny 2. I was gonna say, I felt like I should have brought some popcorn today. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, for, uh, for once in the past, like, three months, I have more than one game on my list. Hooray! Yay! Uh, so yeah, Destiny 2 uh, recently had the uh, final mission and cinematic for the final season of the Witch Queen expansion. And uh, we... We usually talk about songs here. Uh, it kind of makes it seem like we uh, we value, so to speak, them being memorable um, more than them being cinematic. But uh, the new theme that plays on the tower, which here's to the theme again: the tower is your social hub, but it's part of the last city. So still on the theme. Yay! Uh, yeah, I actually thought it was it part of the terrible. regular episode before, uh, before <laughs> now playing Coalesced. So I wrote yeah. up my notes on it as though it was part of the regular episode. Oh, and I even said it had a similar vibe to the Anno 2070 song. Yeah, it, it would have fit in, because it, it is for yeah. a, a, social, a social hub. But uh, yeah, the, the song changes. I won't go into the, the story, because I wouldn't need to explain a lot of stuff. Basically, they changed the music for the social hub, uh, at least for now. I imagine it might change back with uh, the next expansion. Happens, but 
really gives a sense of time and place to the event. Yeah, and, and it really fits the, the emotions of the event. Because uh, much like the song uh, goes, y you get first a sense of uh, sadness uh, and maybe, maybe apprehension, I, I suppose. But it moves into sort of a, a newfound, um, newfound purpose, let's say, sort of newfound reason to fight or newfound courage. And at the end, however, there's the stinger that hints that uh, the villain isn't done with us, hmm. and uh, that's because the next ex next expansion is literally called Lightfall, so things will go dark, quite nice. literally. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's it's a more cinematic track, the one on the playlist, than the kind of music we usually bring up. But uh, I, I thought it, it just captured the, the current emotion going on in the story too well to pass. Because when a, when a composer lands it that well, I think it, it deserves praise. And, uh, well, Sounds good. that is Destiny 2, which it has been has been a mainstay for about half a year on my list. Now for the stuff that hasn't been a mainstay on my list. Mm -hmm. Dead Cells. I've gone back to Dead Cells because of uh, reasons. Those I, reasons yeah, being the same. upcoming uh, Castlevania I, DLC, I assume. Yeah, I am uh, trying to warm myself up to be able to play the Castlevania DLC. The thing is, I forgot how much I suck at this game. <laughs> Fair. Hey, you and me both, brother. That I'm sure why... I will suck too when I get to it. Yeah, that uh, that is why the song on the playlist is the, is the song for the first stage, because uh, yeah. I hear that a lot. <laughs> and honestly, it's a pretty good song. It's a like, pretty good song. It has the energy of uh, you know when you are in PE class and you've done three laps around the stadium. And uh, the coach is like, come on, you can do one more. You can do one more while running again, uh, next to you. That's, uh, that's the game thing to you. You can do one more run. You can do one more run. Um, I will say for the most part, I agree. And I really like this song. But there's a vocal sweep in here that happens at just about every transition. It gets annoying fast. It's that this... whole sound you hear in a lot of songs, but I think in this yeah. one it's actually very overused. Yeah, I I can't tell how how often it actually plays in game. I I think the big the big deal is that uh, the first stage is one you really go by fast, so you don't hear the the background music too much. Uh, yeah, your and, first uh, your first couple of runs you might you might hear more, but usually uh, your third fourth run through, y you are clearing the first stage real quick. It it even rewards you, you for finishing it in less than two minutes. Exactly. Mm. And uh, so that's all the more reason for the initial hook to be strong, which it is. Agreed. Yeah, and the game also has a, a really cool mechanic where the background music gets two more instruments added in and the the tempo goes up as you kill more enemies and gain more movement speed. So it's a really cool integration of gameplay mechanics with the soundtrack. Yeah. Yeah. If you murder enemies fast enough, the game literally increases your movement speed by like fifty percent so you can murder the next batch faster. And you literally set the ground on fire, though it's only cosmetic in this situation. Good. It's a great game. Because if it wasn't cosmetic, I would be like, I never want to do this because I will burn myself. Well, you have tools to oh, set no. the How ground well... on fire, but those don't burn you. They only burn the enemies. Yeah. And uh, I actually have a third game I've been playing, which isn't on the playlist because I don't have too much to say about the soundtrack, to be honest. But uh, as of the time of this recording, we are... Uh, during a free weekend for the game Marvel's Midnight Suns on Steam. Oh yeah. And How uh, that? I've I've been trying that out. Um I'd say the game is rough around the edges. I really like the combat, uh and I really like to see the the Abbey sort of 
come alive as we recruit more heroes and build more upgrades. I am I'm a sucker for base building and being able to up upgrade the place you live in. That's sort of I stuff. get it. Um, let me tell you about Atelier Miru. <laughs> oh boy, it, it's part of why I love the Suikoden franchise, incidentally. But uh, yeah, I, I I really enjoyed the gameplay of the game, but everything else feels rough around the edges. Uh, the writing feels a bit. Uh, it, it gets better over time, but it it's still. Uh, uh, there's way too many influences from the MCU. I wish it was more of a, a, a independent thing. Like it's not part of the MCU, but you can clearly see that the MCU has changed Marvel. Oh yeah, well I mean it's a massively popular franchise. Uh, franchise enhancement. Like, of course they would lean in that direction. Why wouldn't they? I I kind of wish they didn't because visually there are some things, especially with uh, Doctor Strange, that just kind of feel yeah, but, derivative. Yeah, but at the same time, if you try too hard to say we're not the MCU, we are on the same faces. But you know, you get Marvel's Avengers, which will end online services soon. By the way. I mean, I mean, awesome. This this game doesn't go as far as it might seem. Like you don't see the actors' likenesses, uh, yeah. which is also a bit of a weird thing because some characters just look off. But well, that's beside the that's beside the point. But um, facial animations look a bit clunky. Like characters feel unemotional during dialogue. Uh, the soundtrack is basically generic superhero stuff mixed with generic mystic-ish stuff because you are fighting a supernatural enemy. That's disappointing with the unified color theme and like yeah. characters like Ghost Raiders. They could have gone for some pretty good work. I've heard guitars, like electric guitars, I think in two tracks and one of them seems to play at random while I'm at the Abbey. I don't get it. It's weird. That does but, sound weird. Uh, yeah, the the gameplay is is great. I I love the the combat animations. As much as I railed on the facial animations, the combat animations are really cool, really impactful. But um, yeah, it, it seems like it might have been a case of too many cooks. I guess that's very possible. It doesn't feel like yeah, it has a cohesive one less vision. cook that's gonna be around, given that. Uh... The one in charge of uh, this game and the uh, XCOM reboot apparently left 2K recently. Yep, uh, both have uh, left Pyrexis and with it 2K. Uh, the, on the week prior to this recording, uh, from what I understand. So yeah. um, we'll see where the the XCOM franchise goes because it was yeah. the same team basically. But yeah, um, if you are worried about the game because of gameplay, I would say don't be. The gameplay is cool. It feels nice. Good. The heroes feel powerful as, as they should. But if you're worried about Midnight Suns for other reasons, then you might be correct. Because it is lacking a bit in other areas. But to me, the gameplay is fun enough that I can overlook even the story, even though I usually am. Uh, big critic of video game plot lines. Boy howdy flashbacks games will do yeah, boy howdy flashbacks to Kiwami 2 again. <laughs> uh, so yeah that's that's been my my last couple weeks with gaming. Sounds pretty good. Fair enough. And with that that is all the time we have for this episode. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. As always you can find us at the email and Discord Listed below, we will have the soundtrack playlist for you in the link in the description as well. See you guys next time, everybody. Goodbye. See you next time.